Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we are going to review a new Ambernic device. This is called the ARC. There's actually two different models. There's the ARC-D, which is this one here. It comes in black and gray, and it has a couple extra features. It has a touch screen and can dual boot into both Linux and Android. It's a little bit more expensive. It's about $100 after shipping and all of that. And then there's a cheaper model, which is called the ARC-S, and this is about 80 bucks. This one doesn't have a touch screen and can only boot into Linux. Now the chipset on these devices is nothing special. We've seen it for a couple years now. It is the Rockchip RK3566. You may know that from the Ambernic RG353 series, but then also a few PAL Kitty devices like the RGB30 and the X55. So when it comes to the upper limit of performance, that means you'll be able to play most Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, and Dreamcast games with a couple tweaks here and there. Now there's a few reasons why I find this device so exciting. Number one is the fact that it's obviously modeled after like a Sega Saturn controller or the six button Sega Genesis controller. That's pretty cool and very nostalgic. On top of that, we have six face buttons. That's pretty rare in handhelds. That's gonna make it awesome when it comes to fighting games. On top of that, we have a classic D-pad that's modeled after the old Sega ones as well, and it actually works really well. So that's gonna be pretty awesome too. And then finally, it's a four inch four by three aspect ratio display. That means it's gonna be nice and big when it comes to playing retro systems. And this is obviously modeled specifically for retro gaming. It doesn't have any analog sticks, which can cause some problems with those more advanced systems. But when it comes to playing those classic games, it's going to be an excellent fit. So what we're going to do in this video here is just really pick everything apart and see whether or not this device is going to be worth buying for you and your specific use case. We've got a lot of ground to cover and so grab a snack and drink and let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as always, let's get started with these specs. Like I mentioned, this has an RK3566 chipset, which is a quad-core CPU. The device also comes with LPDDR4 RAM. You'll get one gig with the low-end model and two gigs with the high-end one. And the amount of RAM here is not gonna make a difference when it comes to emulation. They just put two gigabytes in the one that dual boots into Android. And that's because Android does require more RAM just to work sufficiently. Now the high-end model also has internal storage, 32 gigabytes. And again, this is for Android because it's installed on that internal storage. The display here is four inches with a 480p resolution and a four x three aspect ratio. And it is an OCA laminated panel and it'll be touchscreen with the high-end model and not for the other. And the battery here is 3,500 milliamp hours. That's a solid size for a device like this. You should get an average of about six hours of gameplay depending on what you're playing. And for its size, it's relatively lightweight, 243 grams. For connectivity, we have dual band Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth 4.2, which means we'll be able to connect to the internet to earn retro achievements, but then also connect to external controllers if we'd like. Now the Linux operating system is based on a version of Bodicera, and of course the top end model will also boot into Android. And this is the same version of Android we've seen on other devices from Ambernic like the RG353 series. Other than that, a couple other features worth noting is that it does have a mini HDMI port, so you can connect this to an external monitor. And of course, we'll test that later in the video. And then finally, we also have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Now, as of releasing this video, the device has not gone up for sale just yet, but if you're watching this on the day it releases, then it should be out in less than 24 hours. And one of the things Ambernic does when they first release a device is that they give it a discount in the first 48 hours. And so, as you can see here, you'll save about $8 between each device if you order it early. And note that they don't plan on shipping it until around 20th of November, so about two weeks from now. Now, depending on the model you get, you'll have different color options. The Arc D or the high-end model will come in solid colors. They have this one that they're calling gray and then another that they're calling black. And these are the only two color options you can get for that price point. At the lower end price point, we have a similar situation where we have two different colors. We have a transparent black and then what they're calling transparent blue, but looks very purple to my eyes. I do think it's weird that they're limiting colorways to specific models because if you want to have a transparent one, but Android, unfortunately you cannot. Either way, that's the setup they have right now for this release. Next, let's move into the unboxing. It's a pretty standard and straightforward process. It will come with a USB-C to USB-A charging cable, and it'll also come with a screen protector and a quick start user manual as well. But let's get to the good stuff and check out the device. First impressions in the hand, this is a bit larger than I was expecting, but it is a four inch display, so it does kind of make sense that it is a little bit bigger. And as expected, I'm getting a very strong Sega vibe overall. Next, we'll take a comparison between the two models. Obviously, the Arc S on the bottom is going to be transparent, 
And the look of it is a little bit odd to my eye just because it almost reminds me of a Nintendo 64 colorway, but of course we're looking at it with a Sega design. Regardless, if you like transparent consoles, you might like this. Now let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into the black model. First thing I love to test is the texture of the plastic. And the plastic here is relatively smooth, but doesn't attract fingerprints. And the texture definitely reminds me of old Sega Genesis controllers, so I think they nailed it in that regard. Now, I think that many people are most curious about the D-pad on this device. After all, this is the first time they've used a Sega-style one in an Amberdeck product. And I will say that just first impressions of just touching it without any sort of comparison, it definitely does remind me of an old Sega controller. It has that floating disc kind of feel to it. So I think if you're someone who hasn't touched a Sega controller in a while and you're looking for something very similar, I think you'll be convinced right off the bat. However, I tend to be a bit critical about my D-pads and I like to get into the details. And knowing that they were coming out with a Sega style controller, I decided to basically pick up all the other ones that they were going to emulate. So to start, I have my original Sega Genesis controller. This is an old three button one back from the 90s. In addition, I lost my six button controller years ago, so I picked up another one on eBay. And even though I don't own a Sega Saturn, I thought it was a good time to pick up one of these controllers just to kind of wrap my head around them. And then finally, I also have an 8-BitDo M30 controller. This is supposed to be a Sega Saturn style as well. So I want to do a quick dive into each of these D-pads just to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music. Starting with the three button Genesis controller, this one has a hard plastic texture to it, and it also has that same sort of pivot as the Ambernick device we're reviewing today. Now all of the original Sega D-pads are quite a bit larger, and so because of that, it does feel like I have a little bit more control to it, in the fact that I have a bit more nuanced control as I shift the pad around. Now the six button controller has a similar feel as you pivot it around, but the texture of the pad itself is different. It feels more like a really hard rubber than a hard plastic. So the look and feel of it is very similar to the three button controller we were just looking at, but the texture itself is grippier and softer under my finger. Now the Sega Saturn controller is very similar to the six button one. However, as I move it around in the eight way directions, it doesn't quite click as much as the other two we were just testing. Instead, this one feels like it has a more soft and subtle click as it goes through those diagonals. And I have no idea how old this controller is because I picked it up on eBay, so it just might be really worn in. And then finally going over to the M30, this one has a very similar texture in that kind of hard rubber feel, but the pivot and clickiness to me is more similar to the Genesis controllers than it was for the Saturn one. Either way, these are very subtle differences between the four, and I think we have a good idea of what to expect with the Ambernick one. And there are a couple distinctions worth noting. Number one, the D-pad on the Ambernick is quite a bit smaller than the others, and I think that does reduce the fine grain details that you would get if you were really tuned into those older Sega controllers. And then also, like I mentioned, the texture is different. It's a hard plastic like it was on the original Genesis controller. And as a result, it has a bit more slick of a texture compared to the Sega Saturn in particular. But I gotta be honest, it still feels really good. In fact, I kind of think that Ambernick nailed it. It's definitely not a 100% solution, but I would say it's at least 90, maybe 95% of the way there. Now let's talk about actual real world use case. We'll start with fighting games. And when it comes to quarter circles, like the Hadouken move, I had absolutely no problem here. I was missing inputs every once in a while, but I was kind of getting acclimated to the feel and the pacing of the game. And this is also recorded in just my first maybe 20 minutes with the device anyway. And so as a result, I do think this controller is Hadoukenable, and I think it'll only get better from here as I get more practice. Next, we'll talk about Choryukens or the Dragon Punch move. This one's a little bit more involved and nuanced, but I still found that most of the time I could pull it off with no problem. Again, I haven't really acclimated to this D-pad yet, and so I do think it's a promising sign that about 80% of the time I am nailing it. And I wouldn't say it's a perfect recreation of that Genesis or Saturn experience, but man, it is very close. Finally, let's do a Contra test. Now, by default, these controllers are relatively loose along the finger, and so I really don't have any high hopes that we can avoid any false diagonals whatsoever. And as I press down on the D-pad and then rock it left and right, I am seeing some character movement. But the thing about it, every time that my character moves, I know it's going to move ahead of time. So to me, it's not really an accidental diagonal because I can feel it actually moving towards the diagonal. Instead, I think this is just the natural result of using a D-pad that has a disc style design to it. And so to summarize, I don't think I'm getting accidental diagonals here. It's just that the diagonal pivot is a lot easier to read. 
speech. And of course, that's a very nuanced take on it, but as it stands, when actually playing this Contra game, it's a really great time, because if I want to duck down without hitting a diagonal, I can totally do that. But at the same time, I can hit those diagonals no problem as well. And so as a result, when playing a game that relies on circular controls like Contra, this is actually an improved experience over a cross-style D-pad. In other words, yes, I think it fails the traditional Contra test, but all the same, this is a controller I'd love to use when playing Contra. Next, let's move over to the face buttons, and first impressions here, they are very comfortably large. In fact, when compared to other Ambernick buttons, they feel massively oversized, and I really love that feeling. And these are rubber membrane connections and have a good amount of travel to them too. It reminds me very much so of the Sega Genesis controllers that I used growing up. And the buttons are also very solidly in place, so we're not getting a lot of play or wiggle either. Now when comparing to the other original controllers, yes, they are quite a bit smaller than the OEM one. For example, the Sega Saturn buttons are kind of massive by today's standards. Even the 8-bit dough ones, which are a little bit smaller than those, are still bigger than what you would find on the Ammonic. So when it comes down to it, yes, they are smaller than OEM controllers, but still large by Ambernick standards. And as a result, they feel very comfortable and roomy, so I have no complaints about these face buttons. I think they are adequately placed and sized. And I love the fact that this is a 100% D-pad centric device. The ergonomics here really flow into your hand, and so I'm able to just use all these controls and it feels really good and pretty authentic as well. I also like the fact that we have front facing speakers and my palms don't cover them up, so that's a nice detail as well. Finally, on the front, we also have our select and start buttons up top, and it's also a dead ringer in design and feel to the Sega Saturn controller. Now let's take a look at the I.O. up top. On the far left, we have our USB-C charging port, and then after that, we have our OTG port. This is where you'll plug in an external wired controller. After that, we have our mini HDMI port. You would plug this into an external monitor or TV. And then we have our function button. This will bring up the menu in most emulators, and this will also function as your hotkey enable button. After that, we have our volume up and down, and then our sleep and power button. And that's really about it up top, other than the shoulders and triggers. First things first, let's talk about these shoulder buttons. They're a little bit thin, but overall they're easy to press down on and have a nice rubber membrane feel to them. So they definitely have a softer feel to them compared to these Sega Saturn shoulder buttons, which were a lot more clicky. Next, let's take a look at these shoulder buttons. Number one, it's kind of amazing that Ambernick used stack shoulders because it's kind of rare that they do this on their devices. Now, this is also using some sort of rubber membrane or soft dome click, and it is a digital input, so no analog input here. And it also pivots from an inner hinge. That means that when you press down on it, you'll probably want to do it more on the outside of the button than closer to the top. Either way, these buttons are very easy to press down on, and they do have a soft, satisfying thunk to them. Next, let's take a look at the screen. Now, one nice thing here is that it's actually inset into the case. This means that even if you add the screen protector to it, it's still not going to be flush with the device itself. And I think that gives it an extra added layer of protection in case you happen to accidentally drop it. Additionally, I like the fact that we have relatively thin bezels all around. So it is a pretty impressive screen, especially for a device that costs 100 bucks or less. Finally, let's take a look at the I.O. on the bottom. On the far left, we have a reset button, but this is inset, so you'd have to use something like a paperclip to actually touch it. And that's the first time I've seen Ambernick do something like that. Now, we also have two SD card slots. On the left side, it'll be our Linux operating system. And this will come preloaded in the device when you buy it. And they're using a 16 gigabyte card from a company called Kyoxia. And this company used to be a branch of Toshiba until about five years ago. Also on the bottom, we have our headphone jack and then another SD card slot. This is where you're going to put a higher capacity card and then fill it up with all of your ROMs, like with many other Ambernick devices on the market. Looking at the back here, pretty unadorned other than the Ambernick logo. And then we have these slightly curved grips on each side, very similar to how it was on the Sega Saturn controller. Now, one of the benefits of having a larger style handheld like this is that we have plenty of space for our hands and fingers on the back, especially when you consider the fact that your index fingers are probably going to rest on these shoulders or triggers. That means that you're going to have a lot of space for your other fingers on the back. I think that regardless of the size of your hands, you're going to find this handheld comfortable. And here's another angle, and you can see that there is plenty of space for my hands across the back of it. Not only that, the overall roundedness of this controller really does kind of melt into your palms, and so it feels extremely comfortable. So from an ergonomic standpoint, I think this is probably one of the most comfortable devices that Ambernick has ever made. Not only can I reach all of the buttons with absolutely no problem, but I love how rounded it is as well. This is something that I could play for hours on end. Now in terms of recreation, I don't think it's a perfect fit, for example, with the Sega Saturn controller. This one definitely had more angled ergonomics, as you can see, as it kind of points towards the center. 
And so in terms of design, this is kind of a mixture between the Sega Saturn and Sega Genesis controller, which was a little bit more rounded. But overall, I have no complaints about the feel of this device in my hands. In fact, I think it's kind of a home run. Not only is it sufficiently wide to feel very luxurious, but it's quite thick as well, which means that you have a lot of space to grip too. And in terms of design, the transparent models are going to be almost identical. The only parts that are really different is that the inner section where the buttons and D-pad are, are glossy. And again, this is a design that calls back to the original Genesis controllers because they were like that as well. But overall, the feel of the Arc S is very similar to the Arc D that we were just nitpicking. Even the texture of the plastic is very similar. The only other main difference I can point out is that the buttons are gray against the transparent blue. And I do like that contrast, and I kind of wish that the black model had gray shoulder and trigger buttons as well. Okay, now let's do a quick comparison with size and weight compared to other devices on the market. We'll start with the 353 device. This is the RG353M. This one has the same chip inside, but a 3.5 inch screen instead of 4. And of course, this one has a much more compact design compared to the ARC. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the RG353P with me. That's the Super Nintendo style controller. And so I wish I could compare against them, but unfortunately, I just don't have one to compare with right now. However, I do have other devices with the same chipset, so let's grab a couple of those. We'll start with the Pal Kitty X55. This one has a 16 by 9 aspect ratio display, so it is quite a bit wider. And as you can see, the X55 is larger than the Arc as well. Next, we have the Pal Kitty RGB30. This one also has a 4 inch display, but it's square, so it's a little bit more narrow and tall. And you can see this one also has a more compact design. Next up, we have the Ambernic RG405M. This one has a 4 inch display and it's also 4x3. In fact, the panels between the two are very, very similar, same resolution and everything. However, as you can see, the 405M also has that same compact kind of style to it, and as a result, it is quite a bit smaller. Next up is the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This one has a 16x9 aspect ratio display, but still just a tiny bit smaller than the Ambernic Arc. Next, let's move on to devices that are larger. So up first, we have the Nintendo Switch Lite. I was kind of surprised to see that this one was not that much bigger than the Amronic. And then also for comparison's sake, here is the Odin 2, followed by the ROG Ally, and then finally the Steam Deck. Now, despite its size, it's actually a pretty lightweight feeling device. As you can see, it's only 243 grams. That's actually the exact same weight as the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. And it's also nearly 25 grams lighter than the RG405M. Either way, I'm very happy with the size and weight of the device we're reviewing today. It's definitely not something I would ever consider to be heavy, and so I can just kind of lug it around no problem. And that 4-inch display does make it a lot easier on the eyes for me. Now that being said, this is not a device I would consider to be pocketable. And of course, that all really depends on your pockets. For example, here with just my regular shorts, yes, they fit inside, but I'm not really sure I'd like to walk around with this device in my pocket. And so for my taste, I think it's just a little bit too big to be considered pocketable, but I think there are probably people out there who are going to disagree with that statement. Instead, I think this is a device that you could throw in a case and make it very backpackable. And it just so happens that Ambernick did send me over one of their cases that go along with this device. And these are going to be up for sale on their website as well, and I think they're going to be about 10 bucks. And I have to say that, you know, Ambernick sends me a lot of these cases with their devices, and I rarely show them because I don't like them. But for this device, I do think it does make a lot of sense. It also has a bit extra space up top if you want to throw in your cable or an SD card. And they did make a mold for the bottom part of the hard shell case. That means it's going to fit perfectly inside, and you don't have to worry about it jostling around. And so while you might be able to find like a hard drive case that'll actually fit it, I think that $10 is worth the peace of mind to get that official one just so that you can throw it in your backpack and not worry about it at all. At the end of the day, yes, I think this is a largish device, but it's also very comfortable to hold as a result. Next, let's do an audio test with Sega CD at 100% volume. And I think the audio here is pretty good. Obviously, it's not going to be something that's going to blow me away with a device that's under 100 bucks, but I do like the fact that it's front firing, and I think that the audio itself is relatively clear. So at this price point, yeah, I think the speakers here are just fine. Now, before we move on to the software section, I do have a couple other points to make. Number one, we'll talk about the screen. Like I mentioned, this is 4 inches and 4 by 3, and that's going to give you a large size experience. Here's a contrast with the RGB30. This one is a 4-inch display that works really well with retro gaming, 
but it is a square aspect ratio, so when showing 4x3 content you will get some big black bars on the top and bottom. And of course, even though it is a 4 inch screen, you're not going to get 4 inches of 4x3. Instead it's closer to something like 3.6, so a little bit better than 3.5, but you can also see that a 4 inch 4x3 display like on the Ambernic Arc is quite a bit larger. Now in terms of just color balance and saturation and all those other qualities about the screen, I do think this is pretty good. In fact, it's very similar to the other Ambernic devices with a 4 inch display. And so overall, I have positive feelings about the screen. I think it is just fine, especially at this price point. Next, let's test out the light bleed from the transparent model. And as you can see here, when I turn out the lights completely, it actually is very, very solid. You can obviously see the LED light, but it's not going to be bleeding throughout the rest of the case. And same thing with the screen. Even when you turn it over, it's not bleeding through at all. So surprisingly, this is a transparent device that you can easily play in the dark with no problem. Next, I wanted to note that both in Android and in Linux, the sleep function seems to work just fine. So when you tap on the button in the middle of a game, it'll put it to sleep. And then when you tap on it again, it'll wake it right up. Now, I haven't had the device long enough to be able to test the actual battery drain when in sleep. But at the very least, if you're just going to turn it off and leave it for a few minutes or even up to an hour, I think it'll be just fine. Another thing worth noting, the company says it's capable of charging with a USB-C to USB-C cable. And I did find that to be true, but it depended on the power delivery profile of the source. For example, a 65 watt charger does not charge it, but I did find that an 18 watt charger worked just fine. Next, let's talk about software. Now, Ambernic did send me one of their preloaded cards. This one is a 128 gigabyte card, which you can also purchase when making your order on their website. Either way, I want to test it out so we can see exactly what that stock experience is going to be like. When you first boot it up, it's going to ask you which language you want to use. Obviously, we're going to go with English. And then it's going to take a couple minutes to initialize, but after that, you'll be greeted by this main menu screen. And this one's kind of interesting. I've never seen this on a Linux-based firmware with an Ambernic device. But essentially, you have two main sections. You have an emulator section, which will show all of your standalone systems. So this will mostly be for your high-end emulation. And then also, you're going to have a RetroArch section. This is going to show all the systems that can be played within RetroArch. And of note, some of these are overlapping. For example, Nintendo 64 is in both categories. And we also have a couple additional sections, like an apps one. And this will allow you to go through the factory reset again. There's also a port section, but there's not a lot going here other than a link to Portmaster. Other than that, most of the other options are going to be accessed through the main menu, which you can bring up by pressing start. Here you can do things like adjust the sound settings as well as pair a Bluetooth controller. And this is also where you'll go to connect to Wi-Fi. And then also you can set up Moonlight Streaming if you want to do that as well. Now under the game settings, you can make adjustments to things like the aspect ratio or turning on editor scaling. But we're going to leave everything as is since we're testing the stock experience. Of note, you also have a per-system advanced configuration, so if you want to make any changes on a per-system basis, you can do that as well. Under the UI settings, you have a couple different theme options. Let me run you through those real quick. This one here is called Theme 2, and here is what Theme 3 looks like. And then finally, our fourth one is, as you can expect, called Theme 4. Either way, we're going to stick with the default theme for the rest of the video. Overall, I think the user interface is fairly straightforward. Although I do think it's kind of odd that you have two different main sections, both RetroArch and emulators. And so if you're a new user, this might be a little bit confusing, but I would recommend using RetroArch for the lower end systems, and then go into the emulator section with any of that higher end stuff like Nintendo 64 and beyond. Next, I want to do a quick look at some of the games that are preloaded on that second SD card. And like always, the collection here is going to be very mismatched. For example, with Sega Saturn, there are only four games listed right here. And based on their naming, it's kind of hard to tell what games these are in the first place. Either way, I did test out a couple. So for example, we have this one called Outlaws of the Lost Dynasty. And this one seemed to work at 100% full speed, so no problem there. Next up, there's Street Fighter the movie that's preloaded. But this one seemed pretty buggy. For example, you can see the bottom half of the screen has some weird glitching. But regardless, this one ran pretty good, although it did have frame skip enabled. Now, I also tested some of the other games that are on the card. And I found that some of these were just completely unplayable. For example, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition is like completely hacked. So when you throw a fireball, it throws like five of them. And not only that, it's like super sped up and the computer is like really high difficulty as well. Not only that, sometimes the players would just like float in midair. It was just a really strange experience. And it's not surprising considering the fact that a lot of these preloaded cards just come with these garbage hacked games. By the way, to exit out of a game while in Linux, you press the F button and start at the same time. Now that being said, a lot of the games actually played just fine. It was just that the naming conventions were a little bit weird. And as always, there were a bunch of like duplicates and stuff like that. 
Either way, that's a really quick look at the Linux firmware here on that preloaded card. Next, we're going to use the dual booting Arc D model to get into the Android side. And to do that, you're going to press and hold the F button while pressing the power button. After a couple seconds, the device will turn on. And now instead of showing that Sega style Ambernic logo, we're getting their original one. And after a few moments, it's going to pop over to the Android side. Again, when it first starts up, it's going to ask you your language, and then it'll take a couple minutes to configure, but once it's done, it'll ask you to press the start button. And so here we are with the default Ambernic Android experience. And this is very similar to the other devices they've launched before. For example, it comes preloaded with a bunch of Android apps, and as before, they've made some shady selections with the default apps. For example, we have the paid versions of the Saturn, Nintendo 64, and Nintendo DS emulators. And to top it off, like their other devices, this does not come with the Google Play Store. So if you want to add any other emulators or Android games, you're going to have to sideload them yourself. Now one thing that Ambernic offers with their Android devices is a front-end launcher. And to access this, you're going to swipe down from the top menu and then press the Ambernic logo. This will take you directly into their front-end launcher, and when it first sets up, it's going to ask you to press the continue button. From there, it'll extract the RetroArch APK so that you can run those emulators. And once it's done doing that, you just have to exit out of RetroArch. And then from there, it's a pretty simple interface. You're just going to navigate left and right, pick your system, and then pick your game. And if you have one of those preloaded SD cards, everything is going to work right out of the box. For example, if we go into the Sega Genesis section, we can pick up a game, and it's going to boot like that. And so that's a pretty easy and seamless experience on the Android side. And to exit a game, you're just going to press the F button and then navigate to exit through the menu. Either way, I tested this with quite a few games, and yeah, they all seem to boot up just fine. However, there are some configuration things set up on the Android side that are not quite perfect. For example, with Nintendo 64, the D-pad is still mapped to the D-pad on the N64. However, this is a device that relied pretty heavily on analog controls. So, for example, if we try to play Perfect Dark, then we're not going to be able to actually move the character. All we can do is strafe and then look up and down. Other games like Wave Race 64 doesn't control at all. And of course, this makes sense. If we bring up a GamePad Tester app, you can see that the D-pad is reflected as a D-pad. All the other buttons are also registered correctly. However, the main issue here is if you're trying to play any game that relies on a left or right analog stick, you just don't have the input for it. But depending on the game that you're playing, there are some workarounds. So for example, if we go into the Nintendo 64 emulator, we can make a new controller profile, and then we can map the analog up, down, left, and right with the D-pad controls instead. So that is going to unlock the ability to play other games. For example, Wave Race 64 now works just fine. And then same thing with Perfect Dark and others. Just bear in mind that by setting it up this way, you are losing functionality of the D-pad at the same time. So if you are playing a Nintendo 64 game that also relies on a D-pad at the same time as an analog stick, you're going to be kind of out of luck. Now, one advantage to using Nintendo 64 on Android is that it performs much better than on Linux. Basically, any game that you try to play on the Nintendo 64 emulator with an Android is going to work just fine. However, it's not quite the same story when it comes to Linux. We're going to bounce between the two for the next few systems. So here we are back on Linux, and I'm testing out a few games. And I did find that the lightweight and middleweight games, you know, things like Mario 64 all the way up to Ocarina of Time, yeah, these are all playing at full speed. So chances are, if you want to play a game that isn't super intensive, it's probably going to play just fine on the Linux side. But once you start getting to that higher tier of Nintendo 64 games, you know, something like Cruise in USA, yeah, unfortunately it's not going to play at full speed. Now personally, I'm not really sure how many Nintendo 64 games you're going to want to play on a layout like this, especially considering the fact that we only have one directional input. We can't use both D-pad and the analog stick at the same time. Either way, if one of your main priorities is playing Nintendo 64 games, then I would recommend getting the one that can dual boot into Android. Next, I want to take a look at Sega Dreamcast comparing both Android and Linux. We're going to start with Android using the default ReDream emulator. And you can see here at the native 480p resolution, these games are not playing at full speed. And also bear in mind that ReDream has auto frame skip enabled. And the games that we're testing right now, Crazy Taxi 2 and Sonic Adventure 2, these are like middleweight games. So the fact that these are not running at full speed on Android is not a good sign. For example, the standalone emulator they're offering is Flycast. This one also has frame skip enabled, but as you can see, it's about as slow as it was on Android. And again, Sonic Adventure 2 at this speed is not something I would consider to be playable. However, within the RetroArch menu, you also have the ability to run your Dreamcast games. And I found that this ran actually a lot better. Bear in mind, it is also using a frame skip, so it's not going to be perfect emulation. But the speed is much faster. In fact, it's to the point where I would consider it to be playable. Here's another example with Dead or Alive 2. In Android, using the ReDream with frame skip turned on, 
we're only getting about 45 frames per second, and you can feel that slowdown very tangibly. Meanwhile, in RetroArch on Linux, we are still using that frame skip, but it just feels a lot smoother and faster. So again, this is a system I would prefer to play on Linux over Android. So when it comes down to it, even though Android is an advantage with Nintendo 64, it is not with the Dreamcast. Now, of course, I would consider these two systems to be secondary to the systems you're going to want to actually play with this control setup. So let's move over to Sega Saturn. We'll start with the Android side again. And I did find that lightweight games like Sonic 3D Blast, they played perfectly fine in the Yabasan Shiro standalone emulator available in Android. I also found that RPGs, you know, like Magic Knight Ray Earth, these play just fine too. I got a little bit of slowdown here and there, but it wasn't that bad. And while a lot of people would say that the standalone version of Yabasan Shiro on Android is probably one of the most performant options, I found the opposite to be true when comparing it to Linux on this device. For example, with Die Hard Arcade, I would definitely not consider this to be playable. It is very slow. However, on the Linux side, with the standalone Yabasan Shiro emulator, again with frame skip turned on, it's actually just fine. Again, this isn't going to be a perfect Saturn experience, especially if you're a purist and want to make sure you get a full frame rate. But all the same, I would consider this one to be playable. Now I have two other examples to show off. We'll start with Virtua Fighter 2. And it's a very similar thing here. The Android version of Yavasan Shiro does play very slowly. I'm giving an average of about 36-37 frames per second, even with auto frame skip turned on. Meanwhile, in Linux, we're not getting a full 60, but pretty close, something like 55-56. And so while it's not perfect, it's a night and day improvement over the Android version. One of the harder games to emulate is Sega Rally Championship, and again on Android it really can't keep up. I'm seeing an average of about 35, maybe 40 frames per second here and there. Meanwhile on the Linux side, there were many times where it actually went up to a full 60, but on average I probably would say maybe a 50-55. And it's really going to depend on you whether or not you would consider this to be playable, but honestly I had a great time playing it on the Linux side. So when it comes down to it, I'm not saying that Sega Saturn is 100% playable on Linux. Really, it's probably never going to be playable on this chipset. It's just not powerful enough. And it is a little bit ironic considering the fact that we have a device shaped like a Sega Saturn controller, and really it can't play every single Sega Saturn game. That being said, I would say the majority of the catalog is going to be playable within Linux. Just bear in mind, it is going to require frame skip, and it's not going to be a full 60 frames per second with every game. Either way, I found many of them to be playable, and I really enjoyed using that six button layout. In fact, it really enhanced the experience because I knew exactly what the developer was thinking when they mapped the controls the way they did. And thankfully, this all works out of the box. All six buttons are perfectly mapped. Now let's move over to some emulation testing. For the rest of this video, I'm going to be using my own personal ROMs that I loaded up onto that second SD card. And this was very simple. All I had to do was put in a second SD card. It populated it with my folders. And then I took that SD card and put it into my computer and then moved over all my own ROM files. And so that's how I got them all onto the system. Either way, we're going to start with Sega Genesis because obviously this is the other system I really want to play on the Amronic Arc. And as you can imagine, this is a perfect fit. I loved playing Sega Genesis games on this device. Personally, I grew up with a Sega Genesis. We had an NES to start with, and then when it came to the 16-bit era, we went with Sega. And I think part of that had to do with the fact that it was cheaper than the Super Nintendo. But either way, I'm intimately familiar with the Sega Genesis catalog, and I have to say this is one of the best ways I've ever played Sega Genesis on an emulation handheld. The feel of the D-pad and the face buttons are almost a dead ringer to me. If it wasn't for the fact that I was just testing a bunch of OEM controllers, I would honestly think that this is just like the old experience. And like I mentioned, it's like 90% of the way there anyway, so it's a really neat experience. So if you are a Sega fan like me, I think you're really going to enjoy playing Sega Genesis on the Ambernic Arc. And another nice detail here is that the 6-button configuration is mapped out of the box. So for example with Mortal Kombat 3, which is a game I used to play with the 6-button controller, yeah, works fine. Same thing with Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition. This one works perfectly out of the box with the 6-button layout. And it's nice, I didn't have to go into these settings at all. I just booted up the game and it all perfectly worked. And it's going to be the same story with Sega CD and Sega 32X if you're playing a game that supports it. For example, Eternal Champions is a game that I owned back in the day, and I bought it because there weren't a lot of fighting games on the Sega platform back then. But I remember this game being so hard with the three-button controller. In fact, this is why I saved up and bought a six-button controller. I thought it would actually make this game a little bit more playable, but no, it turns out this game is just really hard to play. Now, beyond the Sega systems, all the other ones are going to work just fine as well. It is a little bit funny to see something like a Game Boy, Game Boy Color playing on a Sega Genesis controller, but I also think it's kind of neat to see that as well. Now, Game Boy Advance is a wider aspect ratio. It's 3x2, 
but considering that we have a 4 inch screen it still looks nice and big on this display. Moving over to home console systems, things like Nintendo and Super Nintendo work just great. Even though yes it still looks a little bit odd to be playing Nintendo IP on a Sega controller. One thing of note, in the instruction manual it shows you how to change out the different button layouts for Super Nintendo in particular. By default the four leftmost buttons are going to be your A, B, and X, Y, but you can adjust them to be in other positions if it makes more sense to you. Now another collection of games that work really well with this device are arcade games. And there's a couple reasons why this works. Number one, the D-pad itself is kind of loose and soft, and as a result it's kind of like a middle ground between a joystick and an actual D-pad. And this makes playing arcade games with this D-pad a lot of fun, because it's almost like an arcade stick. In addition, the six button layout games, you know, things like Killer Instinct and the Capcom games, these are all pre-mapped as well. So right out of the box, you don't have to do any configuration with these settings, it's all going to work with the controls perfectly. Now the unfortunate part is that Killer Instinct does not run at full speed with this chipset, and that's just really a limitation of the power on the RK3566. Either way, it would have been really cool if we could have played this at full speed. Now, along those same lines of arcade systems, Neo Geo also works really well. And by default, the four Neo Geo buttons are going to be mapped to the leftmost ones, but you could always go into RetroArch and remap them if you'd like to have it with a different layout. Either way, as expected, all these games are going to play just fine. Next we have Sony PlayStation. These games are all going to play perfectly fine. There are no games that aren't going to play at full speed with this chipset. And so really no surprise here, PlayStation 1 is going to be great. Next we'll talk about Nintendo DS. Now within Linux, even if you use the device that has a touchscreen, the touchscreen is not going to work. So if you want to play Nintendo DS games on the Linux side, regardless of whether or not you have a touchscreen, you're probably going to want to stick with the games that don't require any touch input at all. And it's kind of par for the course when it comes to playing Nintendo DS on these Linux based handhelds. Now if you get the ArcD and can dual boot into Android, you will get the touchscreen functionality. And it does work here very well, and so if you want to play Nintendo DS games with a touchscreen input, you're going to want to get the Android version. And then finally, the last system that I wanted to talk about is Sony PSP. And unfortunately, the RK3566 chip that's in this device just really isn't up to snuff when it comes to playing this system. There are going to be some lightweight games that'll play absolutely fine at a 1x resolution, but as you start working your way up to the harder to emulate games, things like Ridge Racer or Outrun 2006, these games are just not going to play at full speed, so at that point you can turn on frame skip if you'd like. But to be honest, I would say that PSP is not going to be a system you'll really enjoy on this device in the first place. It's always nice to have a couple games here and there as an added bonus, but I would definitely not buy this device to play Sony PSP. Okay, and finally as we start wrapping up, one other thing I wanted to show off is the HDMI out functionality. And this is very simple, you just plug it into the mini HDMI cable and then plug that into your monitor or TV. From there you can reboot the device and you're good to go. In addition, you can pair up Bluetooth controllers with the X input protocol. And there's a couple things you can do once you have it set up like this. For example, after you've gone into the controller settings and paired your controller, if you go into player settings, you can actually choose who's going to be which player. So in this example, I'm going to make the console player 1, and then I'm going to make my Bluetooth controller player 2. Now as we navigate through and boot up a game, as long as it has two player support, you should be able to play just right out of the box. So this will be great for a couple reasons. Number one, if you wanted to have a multiplayer session, you could play like this. But then also you could consoleize the Ambernick Arc. For example, you could use your Bluetooth controller as player 1, and then play wirelessly directly onto the TV. So it's always nice to have an added functionality like this if you choose to use it. Okay, this review is going on way longer than I thought it would be, so let's go ahead and start wrapping up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Ambernick Arc. As always, we're going to start with what I like. Number one, this is a super comfortable handheld. It's obviously a little bit on the large side, but that does give you improved ergonomics and comfort, and I think it's well worth it. In addition, I think we have great controls. The D-pad is very close to an original Saturn or Genesis controller, and additionally, the face buttons are very similar as well. Now, they're both smaller than what you would find in an OEM controller, but I think it is very much so close enough. However, if you're looking for a perfect recreation of Sega Saturn or Sega Genesis controllers, this is very close, but not quite there. The way I'm thinking about it is that I'm very picky about controls, but these controls are close enough for me. And that's also coming from someone who's a huge Sega fan. I also think we have a very nice screen. I love the fact that they used a 4 inch display because it does look nice and big. And of course all the other parameters are great. It gets nice and bright, it has good color accuracy, and also is quite saturated. I also like the fact that we have HDMI out and Bluetooth, which means that you can consoleize the device if you would like. And I'm surprised to say that I think the stock operating system on the Linux side is actually pretty decent. All the games booted up with no problem, the buttons are pre-configured correctly, 
and some of the high-end performance is a lot better than I was expecting from a stock operating system. In fact, something like Sega Saturn is probably the best it's going to get on this chipset. And we also have some nice creature comforts like HDMI out and a working sleep function. And finally, probably the thing I like the most about this device is that it's surprisingly affordable. When I first heard that the Ambernic Arc was coming out, I was expecting about a $125 price point. So I was very much surprised to find that this was $25 cheaper than I thought. Usually Ambernic will actually go more expensive than I guess, and so I was pleasantly surprised at this price point. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that these are almost pal kitty prices, and that's very competitive. Especially given the fact that the build quality on this device is miles ahead of anything that comes out from pal kitty. Now of course it's not a perfect device, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about it. Number one, unfortunately Saturn is not at 100% playability. But of course I knew that going into it because of the chipset they chose to use. Now, if you're not picky about Sega Saturn, I do think it gets pretty close, and the majority of games that you want to play will probably be somewhat playable here. However, I just can't get over the fact that we have something that looks like it's perfectly built for Sega Saturn, but it just isn't powerful enough to do so. Now, on the Android side, I do have a couple complaints. Number one, there are no Play Store services. That means you cannot go and download an app directly from the store. Instead, you'll have to search around the internet for an APK and then sideload it yourself, and that is less than ideal. And this also will break functionality for many Android games if you try to play them on this device. When it comes down to it, I'm not really sure that having a $20 price premium to have dual booting into Android is really even going to be worth it. After all, when we saw in the performance standpoint, only Nintendo 64 performed better. And the only other thing I can think of is the fact that Nintendo DS does have touch enabled. But like I mentioned throughout the video, Nintendo 64 really isn't a great fit for this control scheme anyway. So really, if I was king for a day, I would have all of these be at that 80-ish dollar price point. And then also, we wouldn't have certain colorways hidden behind certain price points. And then finally, the last point I wanted to make is that I'm not really sure we're going to see any community support with the Ambernic Arc. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Ambernic has not had a very good relationship with community developers over the past year. Even after years and years of requests, they still are not sharing source code. And as a result, the community developers are not able to unlock the device to its full potential. And I think we've reached a boiling point where most of these community developers just don't want to work with Ambernic devices anymore. And so while I do think that the stock operating system is still a pretty decent experience, I do wish that we had the opportunity to have it even better. So if anything, I would say to not buy this device if you're expecting to have community firmware on it sometime in the future. But of course, we could always be pleasantly surprised sometime down the line. So when it comes down to it, do I recommend the Ambernic Arc as a device worth buying? And of course, as always, it's really going to come down to you and your use case. And I think to best describe it, we'll talk about me and my own preferences. Like I mentioned before, when it comes down to it, I'm a huge Sega fan. The Sega Genesis is one of my favorite systems of all time. And there's so many games in this catalog that I have committed to muscle memory. And I have to say that playing these Sega systems on this device is just a dream come true for me. So I guess the way I see it, if you are a big Sega fan and you want to have a somewhat authentic experience, for about $100 or less, I don't think you're going to find anything better than this one right here. I also think it's going to be great for fighting games with that six button layout. And I think in general, it's just a really comfortable handheld that is really retro focused. So in the end, yes, I do recommend this device if you do think it's going to be a good match for what you want to play. And I really appreciate the fact that Ambernic kind of went out on a limb by making a very niche device. And I was also surprised to find that they basically nailed it from a hardware perspective. I've got a couple gripes, for example I wish it had a more powerful processor, but all the same, there are way more things that I like about this device than things that I don't like. Anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Are you picking this one up, and if so, why? And if not, why not? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.